The word of encouragement that I have for you today is really about suffering. I entitled it um, Becoming an Overcomer. Is that what I called it? Yeah, something like that. And, you know, basically it's that in this world, Jesus said, we are going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So we, we can't expect life to be easy. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or you're an unbeliever. Stuff is going to happen. People are going to fail us. Disasters are going to occur, the unexpected, whatever it is. But it's what, it, what we do with our suffering that determines whether we're overcome by our suffering and we stay stuck in it, or whether we use that suffering, or whether we allow God to use those hard things to bring us to the land of our destiny. This is what happened in my life. I could have stayed stuck in my depression, in my sorrow, in my guilt, in my regret over the past. Or I could be honest with the Lord, say, God, I screwed up. Here's my mess. Now do something with it. And when we offer it back to the Lord, those things that the enemy uses to press us down can be the very things that propel us to the land of our destiny. In John chapter 5, there was a certain man who had been sick for 38 years. He's lying by this pool. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been in that condition a long time, he said, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said, Rise, take up your mat, your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. It, so I just really, I love that story because Jesus approaches this man who's been stuck in illness for 38 years. And he doesn't just walk up and wave a magic wand and say, be healed. He says, do you want to be made well? And this is the key. Every person in this room has stuff in their life, your life and my life right now, that hurts. And I want to just teach you the most marvelous secret about hurts is that they can become something that God uses for good in our lives and the lives of others. But the key is we've got to want to be made well. We've got to believe that the Lord can use those things for good. Otherwise, we get stuck in bitterness and regret and sorrow. And we can't move forward. We're like that man lying on the mat. Amen. So how do we take up our mat? It's as simple as letting go of whatever's holding us there. And as I studied this out, I discovered that I think for myself and for others, the biggest thing that keeps us from moving forward out of our sorrows is offense. And what I mean by offense is when other people hurt us. And it's going to happen. If it didn't happen today, it'll happen tomorrow. If it doesn't happen tomorrow, it'll happen the next week. Somebody's going to hurt you or say something hurtful or do something hurtful. And what we do with that offense really determines um, whether we get stuck in it or whether we move forward. Um, the word offense in the Greek language is actually scandalon. And the word scandalon means bait stick. In other words, if you've ever seen a live animal trap, the piece of the trap that holds the bait, in our animal traps we use peanut butter, Every live animal loves peanut butter. And so you smear the peanut butter on this part of the trap and the raccoon or the possum goes in there and starts chewing on it, saying, mmm, this is pretty good. And if he, gets, if he gets fixated on that bait stick, guess what's gonna happen? The, the trap is gonna close behind him and he's gonna get stuck. And this is what happens when we get offended or hurt. If we choose to hold on to that offense, guess what happens to us? we get stuck in the trap of the offense. Offenses become toxic when we can't deal with them through the lens of, of God's love. And so what I've learned is that bitterness can be the root of so much evil in our lives and it can eventually affect our, even our bodies and cause us to become like that man lying on the mat, unable to move forward. And 
if this is you, if you, it, when, as I'm speaking, you're thinking about something that's happened to you that's really, really hurt, or words that have been spoken, and you just can't get them out of your head, and you feel like maybe you're that one that's stuck in the trap. You've taken the scandal on. It can keep us stuck, unable to move forward, but we can get out of that trap as quickly as we moved into it by doing one thing, that's just forgiving. I know that sounds really, really simple, but for someone who's been deeply wounded or abused, forgiveness can be a really, really hard thing. It can be very, very difficult to forgive from the heart, but if we're unable to forgive, what happens is when we don't offer those that have hurt us the grace that God has offered to us, it puts a wall in between us and the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so it blocks God's grace from operating freely in our lives, and it truly causes us to be stuck. You can't operate in the ministry that you're called to operate in. You, if you're stuck in unforgiveness or bitterness, you cannot be who God has called you to be if there's that toxic bitterness in your life, even a little bit of it. I know this because I've struggled with it myself over the years. I've dealt with a lot of offense, and I've had to come to a place where I can forgive that person, those people, bless them, and let it go. And even realize that what the enemy has sent to harm me, or maybe somebody else meant to harm me, could be the very thing that God uses to bless me and bless other people. And this is what happens. You, you can turn it around. You can become an overcomer rather than being overcome by making that simple decision. That I'm not going to let that person control my life. I'm not going to let that situation control my destiny. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to take my eyes off of myself, off of that person, and I'm going to put them right back onto the Lord and worship. And as we do that, we're propelled forward into our destiny. Forgiveness breaks the power of darkness and releases you into the fullness of your destiny. Isn't that amazing? Joseph is the perfect example of this. Joseph in the Old Testament, my favorite Bible character. Nobody that I know has ever been offended as much as that man was. He was sold by his own brothers into slavery because they were jealous of him. And he, this man who was of royal blood ends up becoming a slave, and he's faithful in his servanthood, but even in the midst of his servanthood, he's falsely accused for something that he didn't do. And he gets thrown into prison. Can you imagine living with that kind of offense? And I don't know how long it took Joseph to deal with that, I don't know if it was a quick thing, if he right away forgave his brothers. If I had been Joseph, it would have taken me a long time. I would have been plotting my revenge and possibly their deaths, right? Then when Potiphar's wife accused him of, of adultery, oh my goodness, can you imagine sitting there in prison for a crime that he didn't commit? Even then, he's offended by the cupbearer who, and those, I'm paraphrasing a story that I'm assuming many of you know. The cupbearer says, oh yeah, I'll remember you when I get out of prison. He forgot. And Joseph's sitting there, oh, I'm rotting in here for the rest of my life. Can you imagine the offense that he was dealing with? And yet we know that at some point he forgave and the Lord released him into authority and he ends up being raised up to become second only to Pharaoh second in the nation, and, and he's used to save his own nation, the nation of Israel. Now, if Joseph had held on to offense against his brothers, against Potiphar's wife, against the cupbearer, I don't believe God would have ever released him from the prison. How do I know that? Because he would have killed 10 of the tribes of Israel, <laughs> including the one that was the line of Jesus Christ himself. I think God would have just left him there. 
Somewhere along the line, Joseph made a decision to forgive and was released into the fullness of his destiny. And he says in Genesis 45, 5, now don't be distressed. He's talking to the very brothers who sold him. Don't be distressed. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. You see, Joseph has a higher perspective He can understand, even at that time in his life, that God had a purpose for his life, a place, a people, and a time that he was called to. And he wasn't going to let anyone hold him back from that destiny. In the same way, Jesus overcame the powers of darkness. As he said these words about the people that crucified him, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We have to be free of offense to operate in the calling that God has for us. So whenever you think of that person that you're thinking of right now, who's hurt you, this is what you can do. And you'll get yourself out of that trap just like that. And immediately you'll be in the right place again. When you think of that person, you forgive them. Listen, it doesn't matter if you feel like it. Your emotions are not in charge here. You can say it as an act of your will. You bless them and you pray for them. And guess what happens? It frees you and it allows God to heal your heart. Get up off your mat and walk again. And also frees God to operate in that person's life. So that's the first thing I want to teach you. You don't have to be overcome by the garbage that other people dump on you. You become an overcomer. As you take that rock... And you pick it up in your hand and say, wow, this is just the perfect size for me to sling at Goliath. Isn't that cool? It's like the more rocks that get thrown at you, the more ammunition you have for the devil. It's like, woohoo, I got lots of rocks here. Get ready. Boom. It's awesome. And you come to this place of overcoming. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that could be thrown at you, that will destroy you anymore. You overcome because you're going to forgive and bless. You're going to forgive and bless. You're going to forgive and bless. You will become an overcomer. The second way that we overcome is as we let go of offense against God. Now, I know that sounds really ridiculous. Like, how can we be offended by the God of the universe? I'll tell you how we can be offended. It's like when life doesn't go our way when things happen that we don't like? Anybody here ever been mad at God? I've been mad at God. I've been disappointed in God. I've been tempted not to believe in God. I'm just being real with you this morning. I've been tempted not to believe. How can my God, it says he loves me, let this happen. Or maybe it's something that we've seen happen in somebody else's life. This doesn't doesn't match up with the God that says he is love, how can he let these things happen? And I imagine Joseph was thinking some of those things when he was sitting in the prison. He could have been offended at God for allowing so many terrible, unfair things to happen. But instead he says in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, meaning his brothers. But listen, God intended it for good meant it for good in order to bring it about as is to this day to save many people alive. Now that's a really strange statement, isn't it? Because he's actually saying that God had an intent for this chain of events. Now, does that mean that God causes people to do bad things or for evil to happen? I don't believe that. I think that's part of the world that we live in. Till we get to heaven, we're going to be dealing with darkness and evil. But this is who we serve us. We serve a God who's a redeemer. He already knows what's going to happen. And he's going to take again those rocks. And he's going to say, we're going to use this to become a plan of salvation. The bottom line is that God has a purpose. God has a purpose. And instead of being angry at God, Joseph understood that his trials and his suffering were simply tools in God's hand that were going to be used to bring him, prepare him, position him to rule and reign. Did you know that suffering can be the most marvelous training tool in our lives? 
the apostles understood this. In fact, um, I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit. The apostles understood. They have this weird, if you read through the New Testament, you read the writings of Peter and John and Paul. They were weird people. I mean, you'd almost think that there's something wrong with them because they say these things, um, like Peter says in 1 Peter 1, um, and in all of these things, meaning your trials, you greatly rejoice. I mean, picture him actually saying this. I'm not going to say this in my Bible, Bible verse voice. Picture a person really saying this. You know, whenever I go through rough times, I, I just greatly rejoice. I get so excited. Even though for now, for a little while, I might have to suffer grief and all kinds of troubles. But you see, these have come. So the proven genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. I'm, I'm thinking about Paul sitting in a smelly prison in the book of Philippians, and he's got rats crawling around him, and he's got lice on his head, and there's no indoor plumbing, and there's... The food is really rotten. And guess what he writes? And again, I'm not going to use my Bible voice, okay? I mean, think about somebody saying this. He says, rejoice! Again, I say rejoice! Like, you guys don't understand all of those things that are happening. Look at what God's doing through them. It's amazing. He gets to this place where he's not afraid of pain. Just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the furnace when they discover that Jesus is with them. I didn't put them in the message this morning, but I love thinking about that scene. They get thrown in a fiery furnace that's so hot and so painful. And then the Lord appears in the fire with them, doesn't he? And I don't know what was going on down there. You know, I might like to imagine there like touching each other, saying, hey, wait a minute, you're not even hot. Wait a minute, hey, Shadrach, smell my hair. Do you smell anything? Wait a minute, we're not burning. And there's Jesus, oh my goodness, this is wonderful. Hey, how's it going? This is really fun. Meshach, did you bring some marshmallows? Because, you know, we can make some really good s'mores. And, and then Nebuchadnezzar, he, he looks down in there, he's like, hey guys, you can come out of the furnace. And Abednego looks up and says, just a minute, we're having a good time. Do you want to come down and have some s'mores? The fire's really nice and hot, and it's like they're golden brown and they're not burning. You know, you know, they get into this place, they're not afraid of suffering anymore. Isn't that cool? Do you know we can live in that place? Because God has a purpose for our lives. It's not that we wake up in the morning and say, okay, God, just give me some more suffering. Give me some really big trials today because I just want to hurt. Not like that. But when this stuff happens, we can rejoice because we know God's using it to prepare us, to position us. Listen, I wouldn't be doing what I am doing today. Not that it's something super great and wonderful. You can do it too in your own way, in your own world. You can be an ambassador for Christ. All you have to do is just wake up in the morning and love people. Did you know that? Just love people. That's hard sometimes in your own house. But you can't. You can just wake up in the morning and love people. That's all you have to do. And with your own giftings and abilities, God will do the most amazing miracles through you. But you can't get stuck in the scandal on you can't stay in your trap of bitterness and let, and the, listen, the light of Christ won't shine through you if you're focused on yourself or the bad things that have happened to you, if you're upset at God because of the bad stuff that happened. We don't know what God's doing, but we can trust his heart. No person, no circumstance, no evil can keep you from the will of God. The only person that keep, can keep you out of the will of God is guess who? Yourself. You can become an overcomer this morning, right now, today, by taking all of those circumstances that have hurt you and those people that have hurt you, just lift them up to God.
and say, Lord, I don't understand. I don't like this situation, but I trust you, God. Your word says that you can use these things to make me into a vessel that's more able to carry your glory. It's not about me, it's about him. And what I was starting to say, I think I lost my train of thought, is that I wouldn't be operating in the ministry that I'm operating now if I hadn't walked the road of suffering, if that makes sense because it would be all about myself rather than it being all of him. And so therefore, I can honestly say that the road that I walked was a good thing. I wouldn't want to go walk it again, but I'm thankful because the Lord is using it for good. The key to overcoming is to praise and thank God in all circumstances. If you'll trust him with your pain, he's going to use that stuff for good. The very things that you regret, the very things that have hurt you so deeply will become a strength to you, will become a gift to you. I know that's hard for some of you to hear, but I know it's true. I know it's true. Unless you think I don't understand pain, I do. I lost a grandchild this past year. Um, I have four kids and My oldest daughter uh, gave birth to a little boy this past February, stillborn, nine and a half months, full term, absolutely healthy, no cord around the neck, no explanation. She had been set to be induced on a certain day she was overdue, and this is normal. You know, this happens all the time. Well, the hospital was full. So they called my daughter and they said, don't come in. We have no beds for you. And uh, so they said, wait. And my daughter was disappointed, but she said, okay. So the next morning she called the hospital again. She said, do you have room? And they said, we told you. We'll call you when you're ready. Leave us alone. I heard this conversation. She was so upset. She was in tears. And uh, the baby was alive, kicking around and moving and In the afternoon, she got another call saying, you can come now, we have a bed for you. And when she got there, he was dead. Whoa. I was angry. I was upset. Somebody's got to pay for this. It shouldn't have happened. The child was fine. He outgrew his sack and we think was cutting off his oxygen supply. If he had been born a few hours earlier when he was supposed to be born, he'd be with us today. And he died. So whose fault is that? My first thought is, we're going to sue. The hospital needs to pay. They should have done something different. This is an error in protocol. They should have at least invited her in to triage. They should have sent her to another hospital. Somebody needs to pay. And then the Lord gets a hold of me. And he says, will you trust me? I said, I will trust you, God, but I don't like you very much. You let it happen. You let it happen. And I had to watch my daughter give birth to a dead child. It was horrible because I grieved as a grandmother. I grieved as a mom. So I didn't talk to God for about a week. God's okay with that. He's still there. Next week, I hear the Holy Spirit say, will you trust my timing? Mm, That was hard. It was like he knew. He knew, and he let it happen. He says, I'm going to bring life out of this death. Will you trust me? And I have to say, yes, Lord, of course. I don't like it. I don't understand it. But what choice do I have? Do you remember, I think it was Peter, where Jesus says some really hard things, and He turns to Peter and he says, are you guys going to leave me too? And this Peter or John says, well, where else are we going to go? That's what I'm saying. You know, what else am I going to do? I know you're God. I just don't like you. But you still are God. So, okay. (laughs) And uh, so we went on. But I want to tell you, um, the child's dad is not yet a believer. And the Lord says to me, If that young man were to come to Christ because of this child's passing, would it be worth it? I said, yes, Lord, a 
Of course, the babies in heaven dancing around with Jesus, whatever babies in heaven do, I don't know. He's fine. It's we that miss him. He says, watch me bring life from this death. Watch me. And so we got pictures back from this moment where the child has passed away. And I always sing to my grandchildren when they come out of the womb and my son or daughter hands me the child. First thing I do is I sing into that child's eyes. This is who you are. This is how much God loves you. This is how much we love you. Sing, sing, sing. So I picked up the dead baby and I'm singing to Alistair. And someone got a picture of me. And if you, you actually go on my Facebook, you'll see it. There's groups of five white lights all around my head. And we've studied that picture and studied it and found no explanation for that light except for God. The presence of God filling that room. And my son-in-law says, this is proof that God is real. Then get this. It goes on. My husband, is Mark here? There he is. There's my husband. Hi, husband. Yes, God is a redeeming God. I have a wonderful, very patient husband who puts up with me. He calls me, he, what did you used to call me? Peculiar? He used to call me peculiar, and my, other, my daughter corrected him. I'm not peculiar. I'm rare. <laughs> I'm rare. Yes. He appreciates my rareness. So anyway, Mark is in the hospital room baptizing this baby. Not that he needed baptism. It was for us, right? You know, so he's baptizing Alistair and my ex-husband. And just the word ex lets you know that there's been some drama and there's been some pain in that relationship because I'm not married to that man anymore. And yet he was standing there next to Mark holding the waters of baptism and the two men baptized the child together. Later on they came to my house and we had a little wake or celebration as a family and my ex-husband comes up to me with tears streaming down my face. He says, he says, Jean, he says, I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but I love your husband. <laughs> if I could have chosen anyone for you to marry, it would be him. He said, and I think we should be friends. And all of this healing and faith and the proof of God's presence was enough for us to know that this is just the beginning of the glory that we're going to see from that event, proof that God is real. Since that time, and I'm going to close with this story, I did a conference on joy. Are you, are you encouraged this morning? Okay. Thank you. You know, this is really on my heart. I'm, I'm in the middle of a book on joy right now. That'll be my next one. And um, I'm convinced in the New Testament, the word joy almost never appears without suffering being in the same sentence. You can find joy in the midst of any situation when God's there with you. In the presence of God. I feel sorry for people who have to suffer and don't know the Lord. But when we know God, his peace and his comfort is enough. And we can say, I'm not going to be overcome by my circumstances. Through God, with God, I shall overcome. And I'm going to be better because I suffered. Amen? I'm going to be better. So I was doing this joy conference, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. It's like, I know all about joy. Let me just teach you about suffering and joy. And this young lady comes up to me afterwards, and uh, she says, thank you very much for that message. She says, I drove two and a half hours to attend this conference, and uh, she hands me a picture of a man and three children. And I said, oh, well, thank you. What, what's this? And she said, that's my husband and my three children. I lost them all two months ago in a boating, boating accident. In one day on Lake Superior in a kayaking accident, she lost her entire family. And I felt like about this tall, talking about my light and momentary sufferings. That woman, her name's Carrie, she and I have become good friends. And I want to read to you Carrie's words about overcoming. Carrie says, as I sit here starting to think, why my babies? 
I turn to his word and I pray, God, put the spotlight on anything in my life that's raised a barrier between you and me, and I will repent of it. Father, as I reflect on the countless ways that you've loved me well, my heart overflows with thanksgiving. I'm especially grateful for how you've blessed me with all the memories of my families, family and the loved ones that surround me in this detrimental time and how you've sustained me through my losses here on earth. I praise you for your generosity and your grace. Receive my thanksgiving and praise as a small expression of my deep love. Amen. Now, I know that Christmas was a hard time for Carrie. It was a hard time for my daughter. Sometime, and in some ways, it was a hard time for our family. And yet, in the midst of it all, we have God keeping us afloat, don't we? And as we go into this new year, which is about to begin in a couple of days, we can look back on the past year, and there will be some regrets and some pain, right? And some sorrow. We've got a little pile of rocks, but we can suddenly look at that pile in a whole new light and say, this year... 2019, I will be an overcomer because all of this stuff that the devil's used to keep me, keep me, hold me back, it's going to be used to propel me forward into the fullness of God's plan to the exact right time, the exact right place for the exact people that you've prepared me to go with your love. Let's pray together.